Tidal currents must be factored into all trip planning in the Pacific Northwest. This is Dodds Narrows, just south of Nanaimo, half an hour after slack water. This early in the season, peaks on Vancouver Island still carry their mantle of snow. The main passage north used by all commercial traffic is Seymour Narrows. Currents through here can run as high as 16 knots. We continue up Discovery Passage and Johnson Strait, where conditions can be dangerous when strong northeasterly winds blow in opposition to the powerful flow of the tide. Logs are a major hazard in these waters. We had trouble dislodging one from beneath the boat and employed a diver in Port McNeil. Fortunately, he confirmed we had escaped damage or our trip might have stopped right here. This Grumman seaplane looks very different from most of the float planes we see today, although many of those are more than 50 years old. From here, the inside passage is briefly exposed to the Pacific Ocean in the Queen Charlotte Strait, where conditions can be challenging. We are heading for the Nakwakto Rapids, where a catchment area of a thousand square miles, including three extensive inlets, drains through a channel only 400 yards wide. The narrow inlets leading to Nakwakto require careful navigation. Um, we've got a uh slack and five o'clock and leave at uh, the rapids. Planted in the center of the rapids is Turret Rock, also known as Tremble Island. Its trees festooned with crude name boards, bearing the names of various yachts, whose crews have scrambled ashore to be marooned for six hours until the turn of the tide. After a survey of the area at slack water, which can last as little as ten minutes, we spend the night in a peaceful anchorage just around the corner. The following morning we return to Nakwatko to observe the rapids at full flow. The turbulence is ferocious. We take care to steer well clear of the main outflow. Tremble Island pushes an impressive bow wave. Runaway logs are an added hazard. After one hour we turn downstream and are carried along on the powerful current flowing towards the open sea.
the incoming ocean tide creates steep waves where the two bodies of water meet. Queen Charlotte Sound we encounter more logs. The prospect is gloomy with steady rain and threatening clouds. The radar shows more to come. We turn into Fitzhugh Sound and meet the BC ferry coming south from Prince Rupert. The rain is relentless and together with melting snow feeds numerous waterfalls of every size and variety. We head inland towards Kitimat and weather-wise we find ourselves in a different world. The Indian village of Hartley Bay is the jumping off spot for entering the forest for a chance to see spirit bears. These white bears are unique to this one area. This is the town of Kitimat at the head of Douglas Channel. Logs even drift into the marina. We head next up narrow Grenville Channel and spend the night in scenic Nettle Basin.
We continue on to Prince Rupert. A local regatta is in progress. Dixon Entrance is the second portion of the inside passage, exposed to the open ocean. But the weather is favourable, and we cross without delay to the Alaskan port of Ketchikan. During the summer months, as many as five cruise ships per day call here. The skies are abuzz with float planes carrying goods and passengers to outlying areas. The rain is back. Downtown shops cater to tourists who arrive by ship, ferry and plane. We take in a lumberjack show arranged for their benefit. Choppers ready. One, two, go! Alright, here we go, working on the face down out there. Cheer them on. The marinas are crammed with a wide variety of boats. This one occupies a tidal grid, which allows the hull to be worked on at low tide. Thirty miles north is the tiny settlement of Myers Chuck. The narrow dogleg entrance into the harbour is hard to see until the very last moment. The government dock provides a convenient overnight stop for visiting yachts, but the permanent year-round population has dropped to less than 10. The post office can be reached by tender across the harbour. Louisa tries the phone in rustic downtown. Mail is collected every Tuesday. The postmistress brings sticky buns to visiting boats in the morning. We continue on our way to Rainy Wrangell, where the marina is a mile out of town. From here, to reach Petersburg, 
we negotiate Wrangell Narrows. Twenty miles in length, this narrow and twisty channel is well marked with over 60 navigation aids and five sets of range markers. It is best avoided in fog or at night when up to 15 navigation beacons simultaneously winking at you through the darkness present a confusing picture. The business of Petersburg is fishing and we are directed to a berth vacated by a fishing boat currently out at sea. In a reversal of the usual situation, it is Venture's turn to look small, surrounded by her working sisters. Petersburg is of Norwegian heritage. It is here we begin to feel the real Alaska experience. The weather turns fine for us as we head eagerly towards the glaciers now within our reach. We encounter floating ice for the first time as we approach the entrance to wonderful Tracy Arm. On either hand, soaring cliffs rise sheer from the water. Fed by melting snow, nameless waterfalls cascade and thunder into the fjord. The scene is so magnificent, we cannot decide where next to turn our eyes. Through binoculars, we spy insect-like objects, which turn out to be kayakers, diminished to near invisibility by the immensity of their surroundings. Luminous chunks of ancient ice shimmer an electric blue, as if powered from within by cosmic energy. The pack ice thickens when we reach the junction of the channels leading to the north and south Sawyer glaciers. We join a Disney cruise ship parked amid a sea of ice. We launch the tender and Chris nudges Venture through the flows while I record her progress. A scalloped block of ice, as clear as crystal, obstructs our path. Thank you. 
The floating ice creates a gallery of sparkling sculptures resembling animals, birds or fish, shape-shifting as we pass them by. We decide to capture a sample of ancient ice to cool our cocktails. Okay. Drinks tonight. Oh. Drinks on the rocks, but not of the type that line the fjord. After spending the night in the anchorage of Holcomb Bay, we head up Endicott Arm for Dawes Glacier. We pass an icy sapphire grounded on the nearby rocks. A light rain is falling as we encounter ice even more extensive than yesterday. We see the glacier ahead. It seems very close, but the radar shows it is still miles away. We press on through the band of ice, floating on green water. Approaching closer, we are excited to witness our first sight of ice carving from a glacier. Glacier cracks and groans as we wait, with bated breath, for another cascade of ancient ice to be freed from its frozen tomb. We launch the tender and Chris runs Venture back and forth, keeping her one quarter mile away from the fractured face. The process is mesmerizing. We could watch for hours, but we have already dallied longer than we should. 
the tidal gate is closing for our next destination. Towering cliffs bear the scars from the ice that ground its way past them eons ago. A rock rides an ice flow to a new resting place. Both here and in Tracy Arm, flows provide resting spots and berthing platforms for harbour seals. Bloodstains are evidence of a recent birth. We keep well clear so as not to disturb them but we doubt that cruise ships do the same. Our reluctance to leave has put us behind schedule, but the amount of ice prevents us from increasing speed. We are heading for an anchorage within Ford's Terror. This place is named after a Navy crewman who in 1889 mistimed the tide and spent several hours dodging whirlpools and blocks of ice. The dogleg entrance is narrow and becomes a maelstrom at every turn of the tide. It is perfectly safe at slack water. We are 30 minutes late, but although the tide is gathering speed, Venture's power carries us safely through. Guidebooks tend to dwell on the name Ford's Terror and its associated hazards, but are more reticent on the Feast of Wonders that lie within the entrance. We are entranced by soaring cliffs, magnificent waterfalls and still waters, the colour of jade. We seem to be under scrutiny from monster-like faces glaring down at us from brooding crags. The anchorage is in the northern arm where two boats are already secured, barely visible against the grandeur of their surroundings. <laughs> we are welcomed by the crew of Penguin with whom we had been playing hopscotch all the way up the coast. The following morning we launched the tender to explore the fjord. We enter the southern arm through a narrow channel through which the outgoing tide is running fast. We speed back to the main entrance of Ford's Terror for a closer look than we had time for during our entry yesterday.
our greater speed conveys a more accurate impression of the entrance. Tender's smaller size allows us to poke into nooks and crannies, including this exquisite cascade, tumbling down hundreds of feet through a narrow cleft in the rocks. The following day, the tide determines the time of our early morning departure, providing another opportunity to take photos from the tender. I speed through the exquisite fjord and out through the entrance ahead of Venture to film her coming through the crooked inlet. We head north to Juneau, and from the isolation of the fjords, we enter a harbour bustling with activity. Huge cruise ships dwarf everything around them, including Venture. Undocking is an interesting procedure, overseen by an enthusiastic golden retriever belonging to one of the longshoremen. Juno receives plenty of rain and mist drapes the surrounding slopes. An overview from the Mount Roberts tramway shows the city nestling between the mountains and the harbour with cruise ships dominating the town.
A major attraction is the Mendenhall Glacier, seen here as we head for Gustavus, located just outside the entrance to Glacier Bay. Charter boats dominate the small marina. Halibut is the main catch, and each boat is allowed to keep just one fish per client, although this boat actually caught 40 fish, with the remainder being returned to the sea. Lupins and dandelions predominate as we await a taxi to take us to the small terminal building at Gustavus Airport for our charter flight over Glacier Bay. This fantastic flight provides a magic overview of the full extent of the bay and the surrounding mountains. we see that John Hopkins Glacier is still choked with ice. We climb as high as 8,000 feet to get over what our pilot calls these hills to reach historic Latuya Bay on the Gulf of Alaska. We return to Venture lying at anchor off Gustavus and are treated to a magnificent sunset. The following morning we enter Glacier Bay Marine Park at Bartlett Cove. We attend a mandatory orientation during which we learnt that to protect the birthing of seals John Hopkins is closed to all vessels from May the 1st until June the 30th and to cruise ships until the end of August. It is 55 miles from here to the Tidewater Glaciers. spend our first night in the inlet at the foot of Reed Glacier. As we enter the bay, a scattering of tiny specks resolves into a fleet of kayaks, making their glacial way across the glacial water.
We take turns in the tender, getting as close as we can to the foot of the ice cliff, which barely reaches the water. The following morning we get underway for Marjorie, the only accessible tidewater glacier at this time. En route, we have to negotiate the thickest ice we have yet encountered, spewed out from John Hopkins Glacier.
We spent three days cruising Glacier Bay. It is hard to believe that it was all glacier and no bay when Captain Vancouver visited in 1793. By the time John Muir arrived in 1879, the glacier had already retreated an additional 40 miles. Our access to McBride Glacier was blocked by grounded flows. From our maximum northing, just shy of 60 degrees, the time is now upon us to head south on the 1,000 mile return journey after another voyage of personal discovery.